The Gulf Injustice Podcast, the official podcast of Detained in Dubai with Rada Stern. Hi, Andre. Thanks for joining us on the Gulf Injustice Podcast in very happy times. You've been stuck in Dubai for uh, many years now trying to resolve your cases, and you finally got home, was it on Friday or Thursday? Absolutely. Uh, actually, the flight was on Wednesday. We receive, uh, I received the information from the ambassador calling me, the, three, um, the two ambassadors, the one from Dubai, the one from Abu Dhabi, plus a consul, on a, at about one o'clock on Wednesday, uh, asking me that they need, they have four points to talk to me. The first one was uh, uh, that uh, right after the phone calls, I should go and have a PCR test, uh, getting my results uh, as soon as possible. The 12 hours is this, and then uh, to try to manage to have a paper copy if I could. The second one was uh, because when you arrive in, uh, then because when you arrive in Toronto, uh, then you need to have a hotel room for three days and you need. Uh, to, to be registered into the Arif Khan uh, uh, apps to make sure that uh, for every traveler that are coming in from Canada. The third thing they say, as you know, as I, we just said that you were going to travel to Canada, and then you need a ticket to take a ticket on the Emirates flights, uh, AK241 tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. And we will have to pick you up and to make sure you are there at about 5.30 to 6 o'clock a.m. Uh, very important, Andre, all that. And as soon as you have that information, you communicate with, with us and all that. The fourth item that we need to discuss is, Andre, you have to be totally, totally secretive with that discreet. You don't talk to anyone. Someone from Ottawa will discuss with your son, so he will be informed, but he will be advised of the same thing. This is very sensitive. We do not want any interference from people in Dubai to get you out. Uh, everything should be smooth. Uh, we have uh, a copy of the document which, uh, with which you will go out, and that should be solving the issue. So uh, please, uh, you go and... Uh, Please try not to come back to Dubai. <laughs> Make you the promise you don't come. And basically, do you have, and then they ask, do you have any questions? Which I did not have any question. So I've done what they told me and they came uh, on Wednesday morning at five uh, o'clock to pick me up, five, actually uh, quarter to five. And they brought me to airport had problem with my luggage. I had too much luggage and didn't have money to pay for it, as you may know. So anyway, I left some of this luggage, the rest I came and then uh, we passed the immigration, which was uh, which took a good 30 minutes to pass with the documents we had. Um, and the embassy was along with me and uh, they brought me with one of the manager of Emirates Airlines, actually, they brought me to the door and they told me that I could speak with people or whatever, only once the door would be closed and the plane departed. And inside the plane, they gave me a special permission to use internet before my phone before. So everything went fine and that's how come I could when I come out of. I mean, just absolutely amazing. We have all been waiting for this moment for a long time now. I mean, when when we first sort of started campaigning for you, uh, one of the first videos we released of you was you calling for the Canadian government to intervene. You'd just been arrested at the border of uh, the UAE and Oman. You were taken into detention. And then finally, you were um, allowed to leave the prison. You were given bail, essentially, while we could sort out the legal cases. Now, were you surprised? I mean, this... This case, obviously, you know, we, we took it to the media and it went absolutely viral. Were you surprised at how much media attention um, your, your case in particular got? I mean, uh, by the way, thanks to all the good work that uh, all my family and you have done, uh, it certainly surprised everyone of the attention that is. Uh, 
And I think it's quite obvious as well that sometimes you've got bad behavior and bad administration of law, but sometimes you have injustice. And I think in that case, it was really a case of uh, injustice combined with bad administration, maybe some mistake here and there, but I mean, mainly injustice. And I think that the people felt it. I mean, uh, this. Uh, and I guess- that's... I mean, you were, you were essentially scapegoated and you were being held for a crime you hadn't committed. It was very, very simple when, I mean, we reviewed the evidence in, in detail and we saw that you were innocent. So it's frustrating that the legal system uh, didn't process this information effectively. But I think when it was raised, it, it really tugged at people's heartstrings, essentially. You, you know, you've got, uh, Alexi was amazing. I mean, your, your, your son, he totally uh, went out there and just advocated almost full time for your release. And I think he really rallied up a lot of support in Canada. And uh, I mean, the government at that point hadn't taken much interest in the case, but as soon as the media got involved and then we started getting MPs involved and they started escalating it all the way up to, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I remember Alexi and I on the, on the phone to them constantly and, and really getting their support. But once they did, it seems that they took your case really seriously. What do you think? I mean, uh, the Canadian policy is very clear that they don't want to intervene in any uh, judicial system of any country. Um, and I say, since my first day in custody, because it started in custody, Canadian government's been informed and very kind with me. So I cannot complain about that. However, they were still doing nothing to intervene or at least until really after the good work that you all put on, that it didn't stop them to bring me from Oman to, uh, to, to UAE. Uh, but then inside UAE, at least once I was in jail, and was I was waiting for the sentencing or the decision of the appeal court, and uh, but the release has been done really, uh, not by legal law. Even if I've been declared innocent, I was still inside. Even if there was uh, plenty of reason to let me out, the technical reports, everything, I was still inside. It's really the last intervention of you guys, with. Mr. Champagne, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, who has talked to his friends, the Foreign Affairs Minister of UAE, that at the end, they released me, at least of the criminal charges, based on all the evidence or whatever. So uh, either they give me a presidential pardon to save some of them because there was some mistaken of uh, some appeal cases that haven't been submitted, but that's just a procedure basically, I mean, uh, to solve it. But they had left over all the civil cases they were there because, because of all that negligence of all this, and according to the law, in, uh, especially in a fraud like this in UAE, you cannot have civil cases if you can, if you're not charged criminally, in in case like this, if it's a fraud, it depends. Not everything, but in that case. But in our case, the civil cases were all gone. With the wall there, how come they let that go? And they even they were judge in absence. Well, I cannot be absent. I was in jail. I could have gone. I guess my lawyers could have gone, but no, we were not even invited or told. And we all know that by fact that people have judge in absence on a regular matter uh, basis in uh, UAE in uh, because so many people are going out of the country so people are escaping because of scaredness or whatever so in that case they they did the same uh, so we were still back to to square one so by the way the uh, the freedom came after three 328 days. I'm taking notes every day. I'm taking my notes every day. I have a diary. I mean, three, so it took 328 days to solve the civil issues. And definitely, 
the Canadian government intervention has been more than instrumental. I had meetings with representative, very high representative of the Foreign Affairs Minister and the Justice Minister, asking me about the case and then guiding us on procedures, how to find a solution which will be legal according to UAE system, which will be uh, making UAE looking good and making Canada looking good as well, without having anybody looking that. <laughs> Basically, it was the mission. Uh, they asked me my patience. They asked me the collaboration of my lawyers. Uh, but at the end of the day, they made us, they organized us a, a, a sequence of events who would go to my possible freedom without really myself knowing. I was knowing only when they were calling me, asking me, you do that. That's the only thing I knew. I didn't, I never knew the entire process where they wanted to go. But yes, in the sense to be free, but how to get there? Well, and basically uh, it's happened after 300, 328 days. I mean, without the diplomatic intervention, this would have been an extremely difficult case to resolve. Um, whether Impossible. The, whether the UAE authorities would respond solely to media pressure, um, it, it just would have been much harder. I think the Canadian government was instrumental and other governments now should look at what Canada's done for you and take it as a precedent of how countries should take care of their citizens. You see, uh, I mean, again, in a particular case like this, it was an injustice. I know that some other countries, there are some injustice. Uh, some other countries, just bad behavior. It's the way to treat people, it's maybe something different. But in that particular case, it would be that would have been impossible without the intervention. I can tell you, the media would not have solved anything uh, because the pressure, again, let's face the fact, there was a fraud. Uh, the chairman of the company was the royal family of Abu Dhabi, one of the very, very important uh, shareholder was the son of the president of Abu Dhabi or UAE. I mean, uh, and then you had also the vice chairman who was a royal family of Kuwait, which are good friends. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if someone escaped with millions or zillions of dollars is outside the country. Uh, those three people were associated with it somehow, like I was, I mean, like I was, Directly, I was not a shareholder with them. I was not as a, a big, but what I mean, so they were probably all scared that they would, and that's probably what the, the guys who took the money uh, figured out. They said, don't worry, we'll leave and these guys will be stuck with the money because they have plenty of money and they will, they will have their image. And actually the fact that I was inside, I was like protecting everyone of uh, being touched. Because while it was the attention on me, nobody was paying attention to the royal fa family members involved. Absolutely. And we even had people who did actually commit the fraud go on and commit frauds in other countries as well, which during your time there, we reported to authorities and, and started an investigation into that. I mean, while you're in custody, and this happens a lot, while you're in custody and while you're still in the country, everyone else can get away and no one's looking at them. So it's a very... Yeah well thought through plan essentially but i mean case, uh, you've got you've got really, oils involved you've you know it, it was a big uh, a big deal your case essentially so um i mean the, 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 that was a big case because of the numbers of clients and the amount of money yeah. although there are some big hits, but that's the per, that's the thing i know but the thing that i didn't know what was attached to it because maybe i was not knowledgeable about the other part of it, which, because if there was some oil deals with this or enter or exchange with gold, with some other countries with sanctions, I was totally out of my knowledge. 
maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I have absolutely no investigation on this, so I cannot, I cannot say about that. But I mean, I've seen many things that were pretty logical that would be something like this. No? And as you know, um, if you take the case of Alabrash or if you take uh, the case of NMC, uh, that are both are London and the principles of them are arrested in those countries, either in London, either in the US, this is quite common in new private companies uh, that the owner bring pocket from clients or banks or whatever and goes from the pocket uh, left and goes to the right pocket and then uh, the back pocket and, uh, and for his personal issues they do that regularly and then as long as he stay between themselves nobody knows outside nobody has questions if it's blue then they're protected anyway and they don't care it's only if nmc was catch and if his elaborate was catch it's only because they were involved in london and they had and that's been detected by, but after three to four years, not right. So that's the other part. Uh, the other part, which I'm not afraid to mention here, rather, you've got DMCC. DMCC, which is one of the most prolific uh, free trade zone in the world. They are proud to say that. They're almost uh, 12,000 companies and whatever. Once I detected it, what I've done with my team of lawyers and accountants and auditors, we ask meetings with the leaders, with the leaders of governance and the leaders of the MCC. What was the answer? We, were, we told them, uh, we've, we come from the IFC. We had a subsidiary in uh, the MCC and uh, they use their books that were approved by the MCC to renew their license. And uh, with this, they were uh, frauding, they were talking to various banks nationally, internationally, and uh, all their books were cooked and forged. Now we have the proof, we've done the auditing, the re-auditing with international firms, and we've been talking to the fraudster, that means the the small auditors who did the book, which told us they do that normally for every companies here. So that means the MCC with the 12,000 companies say, yeah, sir, but we're not there here with the regulation is we're there. We cannot check 12,000 companies. If come on, we check their books and we check what they give to us and we stamp and you go. Uh, again, I said in the MCC, it's the biggest and that's where you've got the biggest trade in oil, in uh, gold, in uh, material, metals, I mean, and that's, is that a way that you, <laughs> I mean, think about it, okay, this is, uh, and that was definitely, we cannot deny that, we wanted to help and collaborate with that, however, you can imagine that nobody really wanted to know that story publicly. Okay, uh, in uh, during my free time that I had, I have uh, people who were going, who were doing uh, gold transactions like gold AE. Uh, I've detected that there were more or less in the country over 300 something, okay, precisely 320 something. So some of them were related to uh, jewelers because there is a gold soup that is very important. Some of them were uh, related to uh, brokers licensed by a private uh, central bank of the UAE. But many of them, like 25 of them, were doing exactly, exactly, exactly the same thing that Goudi was doing. And since then, four have been doing exactly, exactly the same way than Gaudi. Nobody talked to them about them uh, that much because it was smaller, because there was no royal family involved. It was just like a normal company that book, that been bossed. All the principal out of the country. Wow. Okay. I mean... Talk too much. No, 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 no. 
I mean, we, we, we discussed earlier, actually, off the record, uh, that, you know, going forward, that you're, you're, you're looking to tell a fuller story, essentially, of what's happened in detail in this particular gold AE uh, scam, as people call it. And I think that's so important because a blind eye has been turned to a lot of this criminality that's going on in the UAE. And that, you know, the, the effect of that on not only individuals like yourself, because people have to be used as scapegoats and everything else, but to, you know, the diplomatic relations between the different countries, it's certainly being affected. And as a result, I think of, you know, a lot of the laundering that's taking place and a lot of the, the bigger scams like this, and particularly the ones where royals are involved, it's kind of, you know, if we turn a green, uh, sorry, turn a, a blind eye to that, I think it's escalating other issues of criminality that I have, you know, on the side been researching and particularly in relation to uh, Ras al Khaimah and, you know, human trafficking and Iran violations and everything. I think, you know, we have to get a hold on this and, and let them know slowly that, you know, we're not going to tolerate this kind of behaviour because the impact on people's lives is huge. But um, I mean, tell me, like your family must be so pleased to see you. I mean, you. Obviously, I mean, uh, the family is pleased and I'm pleased as well. And everybody is pleased to see us all that. Although it was a bit difficult because uh, unfortunately with the COVID restriction, uh, I have to be quarantined. So theoretically, everyone who comes to visit me is doing something illegal. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, so that's why we have been very, very uh, cautious and limited. For example, uh, last night, my son and my daughter came, but not their family, just them. Uh, then today, one little kid came. And then tomorrow will be the turn of Alexis' uh, daughter. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I have seven brother, which uh, maybe you, uh, they've collaborated a lot with uh, uh, Alexis as well. And now they're all coming to visit. And I even have the MP, Richard Martel, who was one of the MPs that helped us a lot. So he's coming to visit me tomorrow. Uh, so that would be uh, to say hello and to... Uh, I mean, that, that's wonderful in itself. You've actually got MPs coming to your house to visit you and, and celebrate your release as well. I think there's so many people <laughs> that are relieved to get you. But it shows, it shows, uh, but it shows how it impacts the government. It shows uh, the uh, Richard comes from uh, the opposition party. Uh, so that's not the, uh, and uh, uh, he, Alexis told me, uh, First of all, I've talked to him a few times while I was in UAE. Uh, actually, this is funny because he part of his family, there are some people who were used to work with me. I was their boss before, long, long, long time ago. And uh, so they knew my story, but they knew also my story prior to all that. And that's what they say. No, um, I was not, no, I'm, I'm really blessed with the family. Uh, but uh, rather, I want also to, 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 to mention to, to you, uh, what happened to us is terrible, obviously. Uh, this is, but by uh, being a geologist, I've been going through, uh, you can imagine how many of my friends into the exploration business over the last 10 years, including the last five years like me, have had uh, problems, issues, either legally in certain countries in Africa, South America, either by social protest, either by uh, health, either by finance, because financing the exploration was very difficult. So my case, and building a company in exploration is like pharmaceutical uh, companies. It takes uh, easy 10 years and uh, your chances of success is like 99% failure so it's, it's not a success it's failure so i got used to my resistance a, a bit coming from that world no and myself i've been having some resistance but i always still believe today that we have to turn away that negative into a positive yes. and it's still possible I mean, uh, I know that Alexis doesn't, he's not really 100% with me, uh, but slowly, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not saying I'll go back to Dubai, and so no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, this is just a way and an experience, as you, you may, it's an experience and uh, that's finished happily. Hmm. But happily because everybody continued to work hard, 
from you, Alexis, maybe from me inside, even my lawyers, uh, I, I still sometimes I'm a bit surprised, I'm happy from them and this, but then I had my problems with them as well. So it's not all, always them, it's, uh, as you know, lawyers are lawyers, They're, that's an enterprise, they have to, and they, they were doing everything to defend me, at least uh, the one that were there. But I mean, they need to be paid sometimes. So it's all started. One part it's all started because the Sheikh did not want to pay uh, one of the lawyer fees back in 2015. It was, uh, yeah, because we couldn't take the money from the company because we cannot do the same thing that the, the thief have done. So we cannot use the money from the clients to pay the lawyers. I mean, <laughs> so I asked the Sheikh to use his money to do that. And then it's, he said the lawyer to wait, the lawyer started. So it started to be a little, uh, but at the end, the lawyers defended me. They stopped defending the, the company, no? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, this is the sheikh in, in Dubai that was involved in gold. Uh, the, the, the sheikh in uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, sheikh Sultan in Khalifa, Al-Nayan, which is a, uh, he come the, from the Shagbut family. The Shagbut family, if you remember, is, is the one who was the ruler before Zayed. Zayed is the one who created the UAE, which Shagbut was much more conservative, let's say. Okay? But there is a certain maybe, uh, one of the, uh, maybe the conclusion or the perception, I would say perception. Okay, not conclusion because it would be as uh, there is some friction between Dubai and Abu Dhabi. That's my perception. And uh, in our case, was certainly uh, visible. Yeah, you you could you could feel that in your case that friction. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, only by the way to solve it. Yeah. I mean, yes, there, there is a bit of rivalry. There is a bit of friction, you know, ultimately between Dubai and Abu Dhabi, between Abu Dhabi and Iraq. And, uh, you know, it, absolutely, that's the UAE. And between, let's face it, even between brothers. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, in, so, in some cases, they've, they've locked up their brother because it's a rival to the throne and, the, and this kind of thing. Yes, it, it happens. Mm -hmm. Daughters, yeah. wives. Daughters, <laughs> wives, brothers, fathers. You, you know quite well about, uh, I mean, uh, I'm very sympathetic with all these people because having, knowing what happened to me, I can imagine that maybe, although there is always uh, two sides of a coin, in that particular case, uh, the coins is always on the same side, basically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, look, I'm so I'm really happy that you're home, and I know that you're, you you need to rest and you need to party and uh, and celebrate your freedom. Uh, but it, it seems to me that, that you're strong, you're ready to go, you're ready to get on with life. And perhaps, you know, just being stuck in this sort of waiting time in the UAE has given you a lot of time to plan what you're going to do next and to move on. Um, this is, uh, I would say, a privilege of life. This is, you see, when I was mentioning from the negative to the positive, I've been very, over the last year, uh, kind of monitoring the uh, mining sector. Okay, the, where I come from, especially exploration worldwide. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to establish what we established in Dubai is because it, I wanted to have it worldwide. Uh, Dubai has very, uh, some very negative points, but one of the very important point of Dubai, this is the only place, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, or Kuwait, or Qatar, where you can, if you're someone really, really, really international, like I was, I mean, I'm still between South America, America, Europe, China, Australia, and Russia. Uh, this is the only place on earth that if, if you participate to board of directors or discuss with people from the market, from seven o'clock at morning to seven o'clock at night, you cover the entire, the entire planet on the market. And so you can, go relax at night 
and sleep mm. and come back the day after. Yeah. This is the only place you can do that. You cannot do that in London. You cannot do that in Vancouver. You cannot do that in Beijing or Shanghai. You cannot do that in Toronto uh, because you always have to work or really to, 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 to work at night very late or wake up in the morning in the, in the middle of the night to have board meetings and all that. Dubai for that, that was one of the reasons that I... It, there was many more of that, but one of the reasons was that, okay? Uh, so being that, I was privileged to monitor it over the last year because the pandemic was that everything was virtual, right? So I participated to so many mining conferences and courses online. That's a privilege. Now I have a vision of the world which is different than 12 months ago. And as you see in the natural resource sector, we are in a sector that is so linked to the geopolitics today, which was not necessarily there. It's been always a bit the case. But if you look at the importance of the uh, nuclear or the uranium, or the plutonium, if you look at the importance of all the metals associated with the electric cars, either lithium, cobalt, or uh, nickel or, or aluminum, if you take the, the normal one, the copper or zinc linked with the uh, infrastructure construction that is going and from gold and silver and look at the uh, financial situation of the world, gold and silvers and uh, the, the, all those uh, uh, minerals would be, uh, so this is uh, incredible to the level I've been involved to and as a Today, I don't know exactly <laughs> where I get involved myself because I've been involved with rivers before, mainly gold and copper. And that. so I will have to, uh, to try to locate myself, but I'm trying actually to, uh, to write something of this. I mean, of my perception of all what I did because it's a luxury to be able to spend one year <laughs> just observing while you're exactly. not watching and not rights to run a company. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that does give you that ability to stand back and see the bigger picture and perhaps, yeah. um, you know, seriously analyze it. So that would be great um, to get on with that. But, yeah. I mean, look, a lot of people, you know, they come out of prison, they've suffered PTSD, they find it really hard to get on with their lives. But, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased to see you. You've still got that energy about you. So, I mean, that's just, it's great to see. Um, I'll make a joke. I mean, I don't know if uh, and you can publish it because it's really an internal joke. Uh, I was last night with my son, my wife, and my daughter, and then my daughter made me uh, made me laugh. Made me uh, then, uh, mom is not telling you, but definitely this time she would have a a, a little request. So what would be the request that? All the luggage you came with, you open them and just make sure that you empty your luggage and you put your luggage in the storage room. Okay, this is it because I use over the last 25 years, I was coming here. But I mean, I was keeping, I was coming here one week, two weeks, and but always my luggage were ready to leave. Now she asked me this, and I will do that. That's what I will do uh, today and the rest of the day uh, tomorrow uh, <laughs> with the press release to, to raise them to make sure this time at least I will hang on. Not because I want to retire, no. It just, I want to take- uh, take, take a breath and take some <laughs> Yes. <laughs> a holiday in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> a holiday in Canada, that's a nice season to do so. I mean, uh, yeah. by the way, wish you visit us. Uh, certainly, yeah. we, we will visit you as well. I'm sure I'll visit you. I can't, uh, I can't wait. As, as especially if you go in Spain, I will visit you in Spain, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, I'll leave it there because that's, that's quite a long discussion we've got, but we should follow up and, and talk again soon. And again, I'm just so, so pleased that you're home. Uh, it's such a relief for me such a relief for all of us here it's it's you know it's it's been a hard long campaign and then uh i pass the word out to your other people who are building this you see with patience mm. and creativity because i'm sure the embassy has been creative with this and then we can stick get out of that no 
Yeah, absolutely. We can find solution in this. Yeah. Everyone is. And I wish good luck to every of your other clients. By the way, you can uh, mention that. I really uh, sympathize with all of them, uh, even uh, knowing uh, how unfair it can be, how uh, suggestive it can be, uh, how I sympathize with all of them. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, I spoke to an MP the other day, uh, th this week, actually, on another British case I'm dealing with, and I, I let them know what the Canadian government had done, and they were intrigued about that. I think they're going to call for advice, but I think also, um, I don't know whether you saw the American um, who was recently released after smoking marijuana in Vegas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, again, you know, the US uh, Department of State got involved in that one and he got out very quickly. So it, it, it is sort of, you know, the government getting involved. As, and, but we hope that, you know, in the future, they'll get involved without having to take it to media, without having to get that publicity and push first. They should be- Yeah, 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 no, definitely. Definitely, this is, uh, uh, I don't, for me, it's a given, but I mean, again, I've been blessed and lucky, lucky with this. Mm -hmm. But I mean, uh, on the other hand, uh, as, as an advice, uh, I never spoke badly, neither against Dubai, neither against the Canadian government. I've been patient with all of them, and that was truly, okay, because as I told you, Okay, I was a scapegoat and I was, I, don't, I didn't know who was behind all that and I still don't know today, truly. Uh, but I mean, the, the fact is uh, each country has to do what they have to do. So that's why diplomacy apparently is supposed to be that, right? People talking to other people. So we just let them talk and not try to, to because it's very difficult to achieve something if you not down both then uh, thinking that you will make them talk. No, the only thing they will do is talk against you. So <laughs> let's uh, be people to be patient and to go. Uh, uh, on another note, uh, rather maybe not for the uh, interview, like this, there is a point that when you mentioned a little earlier about the fraud, uh, when I was the first 18 months in custody, I, uh, I wrote a book which was from deep inside. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was a bit about various cases that there were in UAE. And you would be amazed how people are creative, how to go around the system. Many of the people in jail are scapegoat, paid scapegoat. Wow. Organized the head. Obviously, they don't come from London, they don't come, but those scapegoats come from Bangladesh, come from, but when you have a, do a, few years a, a manager from Bangladesh that they hardly speak English and he's manager of I don't know how many millions and you ask to him while you're in jail and he tells you, oh, I have a nice life, they paid for me, they paid my phone, they take care of my the school for my kids in the country. <laughs> That's a, that makes it an easy an easy thing to do to embezzle money out of a company and then pay yes. some poor person to go to prison for you and they'll appreciate it they get to send money back to their family in bangladesh yeah you I see mean, this is so that's why i'm pretty sure the authorities they know that so they they're stuck with the with on one side one and the other side so uh, <laughs> so that's why we need to help them to to clear the sky because it's not obvious yeah, well, I mean, that, that's going to leave a lot of uh, fraud victims in the end, isn't it? People are going yes. to lose a lot of money. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, Andre, it's absolutely. just wonderful to have you on uh, the podcast anyway. And uh, I, I look forward to speaking to Alexi soon. And I look forward to visiting you in Canada. And thank you so much. Um, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure to deal with you. It's been a pleasure to deal with your lovely family. And okay. so happy to have you back. And sing to us, and that's me who should thank you uh, <laughs> for all your good works in there. Okay. And even your good smile. Really fantastic <laughs> smile. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm, I'm very happy. This, like I said, I'm so happy about this. So. Okay. But cool. anyway, um, have a great week. Feel free to call anytime. Let me know how you go tomorrow. Okay, good and everything else. Okay, we will send you pictures as soon as we'll be able to be all together. But because of the COVID, we respect the rules. Uh, 
because here we still are on restrictions, so that's why. Okay, it's a bit difficult, but but the fact is there. Thank you very much again, Rada. My pleasure, Andre. Speak to you soon. Bye. Ciao. Thank you for listening to the Golf Injustice Podcast.